I first saw Tron Legacy on opening night, December 17th, 2010, and I haven't stopped thinking about it since. In the 12 years that have followed, its hold on me has only grown, and it's not hard to see why. It's an audiovisual bacchanal, with every eye-melting frame fine-tuned to glossy aesthetic perfection. That aesthetic pristineness is a testament to the limitless visual imagination of first-time director Joseph Kaczynski, whose triumph of ambition overcame the taut strings of big Hollywood money and managed to deliver a film that had, much like the original 1982 cult classic, a distinct and idiosyncratic identity of its own. Beyond just a pretty picture, and a Daft Punk soundtrack that takes up the vast majority of the conversations about the film, Tron Legacy's often overlooked and efficiently effective emotional and philosophical core still resonates in an age where the line between technology and humanity continues to blur, and it manages to satisfy audiences looking for visceral action thrills while we're at it. Tron Legacy's most enduring legacy, though, is a bit more complicated. It's the perfect template for every 20 years later Hollywood sequel of the decade that followed, even if the rest of the wave learned the wrong lessons from the film. So hot on the heels of Joseph Kaczynski's newest sequel, Top Gun Maverick, Let's take a look at the bits of Tron Legacy's code that make it radical, man. Every single frame of Tron Legacy is a precisely measured exercise in cinematic decadence. It's a dynamo of aesthetic immaculateness that is powered by pushing the filmmaking technology of 2010 to its absolute limits, and arguably one step beyond to make sure you have an unforgettable time at the movies. This is a film that understands that the only way to make a sequel to Tron in the first place is to take that same forward-thinking visual imagination and try to take the next logical leap into the future of filmmaking. The CGI in the film has aged better than most. The light cycle chases, disc wars, digital cities, chunky de-resolutions, and solar sailors all have a certain timeless sheen to them. Right in that sweet spot between dodgy CG that existed because the tech was in its infancy, and dodgy CG because the studio farmed 6,000 effect shots out to a dozen different third-party VFX houses that all bid the lowest rate. There's a unity to the vision here, and only one component of it falls flat on its face, and you already know what I'm about to say. Digital Jeff Bridges just wasn't ready for prime time, and one of the few times I think I will ever advocate for going back and touching effects up with contemporary technology. He sits right at the heart of the Uncanny Valley, and the scenes where he's out in the real world are particularly nightmarish. But we also needed creepy plastic Jeff Bridges and the motion capture procedures it helped to codify in order to get to our current state of near-seamless de-aging that allows for 80-year-old Al Pacino to play a character 30 years younger. That being said, once you get into the world of the grid, Bridges as Clue functions moderately better. It's not night and day, but you can trick your brain into believing Oh, this is a computer's flawed attempt to copy a version of Kevin Flynn from 20 years ago. Suspension of disbelief is a hell of a drug. What's more technically impressive about Tron Legacy is that it existed in that brief, blessed window when off of the wild, titanic success of Avatar, pun 100% intended, studios actually shot their films using 3D cameras until they realized it was cheaper and easier to fake it in post-production, which diluted the presentation format and killed 3D cinema in its infancy. The film industry does this all the time, by the way. They take what is intended to be a premium, special occasion format and find a way to shoehorn as much content into it as they can to juice box office receipts. Tron Legacy is glorious in 3D, one of the five best of the rare handful of films that were actually shot using 3D cameras. It's topped only by legit masterpieces from established auteurs like Martin Scorsese's Hugo, James Cameron's Avatar, and, my personal favorite, Henry Selleck's Coraline. And like those 3D masterworks, Tron Legacy benefits greatly from an actual narrative and artistic consideration of three-dimensional space that creates a more immersive movie environment. This was the promise of 3D as a medium. As a flashy gimmick, 3D frequently falls flat, but Legacy's 3D choices aren't just make things pop out at screen. Instead, the choices are answering narrative challenges, like how do we isolate action in the frame, or how do we utilize foreground obstruction, parallel and parallax motion, and rack focuses to show a sense of depth, or how can we show the audience that this world has different rules? For instance, the 3D portion of Tron Legacy doesn't start for almost half an hour. The real-world segments are all presented in traditional 2D. It's only when we first get sucked into the world of the grid that we experience 3D space for the first time, and that 2D to 3D transition feels like a wonderfully cheeky Wizard of Oz moment updated for contemporary audiences. That same sense of intentionality extends to all of the technical aspects of the film. 
Claudio Miranda's cinematography is a masterclass in deliberate, impactful centering that makes the film look striking while also helping the editing to be buttery smooth and feather light. His deeply geometric compositions marry seamlessly with director Joseph Kaczynski's sleek, organic vision of the grid. Together, they craft a color palette for cyberspace that feels like an evolution of Tron. Instead of the murky, monotone, gray-blue base, we have a rich, punchy black that is accentuated by glossy glass. This helps pop the accent whites, blues, and oranges to draw the audience's eye. On a surface reading, the cool, steely color palette may read as reminiscent of the lethargically color-graded Marvel cinematography goop that would follow in the next decade, but there's such a deliberate, even hand to the look of the film that makes it stand apart from the other gray blockbusters of the 2010s. Miranda also has a real sense of what makes slow motion and speed ramping powerful in modern action movies. It's kinetic seasoning, designed to show us all of the minute details of impossibly cool moments. In that way, Miranda's work is more like The Matrix than, say, 300. He also composes and recomposes his shots seamlessly for both IMAX and CinemaScope. The shots that work in IMAX work just as well on the standard presentation because he's not preferring one composition over the other. This kind of intentionality was always present in the film shot IMAX movies, when directors had to go out of their way to shoot on IMAX cameras. But now that the format has become more of an expectation for big blockbusters, that deliberate hand has gone away, and it's led to some really sloppy shots in the dialogue scenes of $200 million franchise caps. Endless headroom. Cavernous headroom. Headroom for days. That sort of shrug and forget about it laziness simply does not exist in Tron Legacy. You can see it in every detail in the film, from beautiful sets that emphasize built environments and tangible spaces, even when the setting could have easily excused the entire film being shot on a green screen, to the costumes and production design that still resonate in industrial and product design to this day. Do you have a gaming mouse or a PC that was built in the last 10 years? Look down at it. See those curvy organic LEDs forming endlessly customizable lines of light? Thank Tron Legacy. The costumes, designed by Michael Wilkinson and Christine Clark, ditch the dorky silk pajamas look of the 1982 original in favor of glorified Matrix-inspired fetish wear that glows under its own power. It still baffles me that Wilkinson and Clark weren't nominated for an Oscar. There's genuine innovation going on here, and what won instead was... Let me check here... No, oh, thank you. To clean that out of our eyeballs, let's look at what happens when an architect gets to tell production designers what to do. There's a beautiful tangibility to the designed world of Tron Legacy. While a lot of Tron sets and environments felt disconnected, Legacy feels like a knowable world with defined limits. It all has this unified look of an environment or city created by the imagination of one person, and that shining utopian vision helps sell Clue's dystopian rule. Actual built environments and real physical sets and props let the actors and audience make an emotional connection to the world, and it also allows for beautiful clashes of man-made design and machine language. Kevin Flynn's mid-century modern mountain fortress is a testament to smart set building and clever reactive lighting that helps to punctuate some of the more emotional moments of the film with its timeless strangeness. Adding to that sense of timelessness is the score, which was composed by a couple of French robots. Don't really need to say much more about that. Moving on. Change the scheme, alter the mood, electrify the boys and girls if you'd be so kind. Okay, fine. The score is perfect. Daft Punk were incredible. It's the quintessential pairing of musicians and source material, and they work in absolute harmony with the tone of the film, delivering on the enormous emotional beats, ratcheting those operatic feelings up to infinity. You can feel your chest leaping with every digital drum pulse on the gaming grid. You feel the tenderness and pain of a father and son trying to reconnect on a solar sailor, and you rock out in your seat to derez, the perfect song for a fight scene. The secret weapon of Tron Legacy wasn't thinking that Daft Punk would deliver a Daft Punk album for a film score. It was Kaczynski understanding how Daft Punk functioned as a musical entity. They were chameleons, samplers, remixers. They were the ultimate postmodern band that never shied away from referencing, naming, and frequently sampling from their influences. So instead of a chirpy techno album, we got the Ur score, a soundtrack that pulls from such a vast array of influences that it sounds like nobody and everybody simultaneously. It's a score that feels like it was delivered on stone tablets from on high to make mundane life sound so, so cool. Like nothing you've ever heard before, but also like it's always existed. 
The reaction to the score at the time was shockingly mixed, and seemed to presuppose that we were all expecting an album's worth of fresh Daft Punk songs. Also, if you go looking for reviews from 2010, prepare to grind your teeth a little bit if you read Pitchfork's take, but that was always sort of the point of Pitchfork. No, RIP in peace, Daft Punk. I hope your robot forms get unexploded someday. And who was the ringleader of all this groundbreaking beauty? Instead of a seasoned Hollywood veteran, Disney gave the keys to their very expensive kingdom to a former architect from Iowa who had only ever directed commercials. Sometimes a gamble like that pays off, and thanks to it, we now have one of the most confident and visually inventive action directors of our time. I've said it before in my previous video essay on Kaczynski, link up there by the way, but there's an effortless elegance to a Joseph Kaczynski film that is perfect for this take on the Tron universe. There's a real, single-minded, complete vision here. Calling Kaczynski visionary isn't just marketing speak, it's apparent even in this, his first feature-length film. Tron Legacy is bravura guardrails off filmmaking, a debut so confident in its voice and so measured in its craft that it cuts through the noise like a knife clinking against a crystal goblet at a fancy dinner party. Kaczynski is part of that now-dead pipeline of commercial and music video directors let loose upon the Hollywood toy box with reckless abandon. A lot of these Greenhorn directors either flamed out immediately, for instance, Kinka Usher's one-and-done, sort-of-triumph Mystery Men went down so legendarily badly that people are still convinced Tim Burton directed it under a pseudonym, or it became easy to rein in hacks. Sorry, G. Occasionally, you'd get someone like Michael Bay, David Fincher, or Spike Jones, who had way too much personality to control, but made films that were so undeniably exciting you couldn't help but fund them. But Kaczynski seemingly falls somewhere in the middle. He belongs with the latter group, but there's this consummate professionality, conviction, and stoicism to him that makes it easy to believe he knows what he's doing. He's a steady hand, trustworthy, the kind of director who seems like he'll take your studio's money out for a nice evening and have it home by 10pm sharp. Tron Legacy is such a delicate high-wire act of tone balancing, swinging effortlessly between operatic hyper-emotion and belaic mathematically choreographed action to moments of quiet contemplative character work and serene wonder. Critics either missed it or ignored it, but the film somehow manages to tell a deeply human story somewhere within its slinky, icy, mirror-polished high-definition ones and zeros, and it has an almost preternatural understanding of what makes Joseph Campbell's hero's journey such a time-honored and effective story structure. It was derided as an empty, soulless triumph of style over substance, but the deep, wounded heart of Tron Legacy is what makes it timeless. Aesthetics come and go. You can make as much perfect iconography as you want, but if the emotional core of your movie doesn't work, it won't stand the test of time. At its heart, Tron Legacy is about a man who realizes just how bad a job he did at being a parent, and then shows us the links he's willing to go to to reconcile with his kids. Adding a legacy to the title of your legacy sequel feels passe, but the film is literally about the legacy of Kevin Flynn specifically, and the idea of legacies broadly. What do we create? What does it mean? And what do we leave behind? Kevin's legacy is the grid, but Sam is also his legacy. As are Clue and Cora, each of his children has a distinct reaction to this legacy. Sam wants to run away. He wants his own identity distinct from his father, even though he feels the draw to discover the truth behind his disappearance. If his father abandoned him on purpose, what good is the legacy of Kevin Flynn? What is it worth? He lashes out at the world, and more specifically his father's company, in reckless and showily self-destructive ways. If he won't find a place in the kingdom that's rightfully his, he'll make a mockery of it. He's aimless, rudderless, and angry. Cora's sheltering has led to a similar recklessness. Terrified of losing the breakthrough of a lifetime, Flynn's retreat into zen isolation and de facto cloistering of Cora has turned his adopted daughter slash mentee into a ball of pent-up energy waiting to make an impulsive decision to change the momentum of her own life. Kevin may be her creator, her mentor, and her god, but he's also the overprotective dad who won't let his kid go out to the party. Clue was created by Kevin to create the perfect system. Flynn's definition of perfection was thrown out the window when the ISOs, spontaneous sentient beings created with no programming directive, arrived on the grid. Because Kevin was too arrogant to see the perfection and imperfection, he inadvertently created a dark reflection of himself, quite literally. An ageless, unchanging avatar of his short-sightedness that still haunts him after 20 years. Our heroes and our villain all need something from Kevin. Resolution, absolution, reassurance or acceptance. And by learning to come to terms with his mistakes and failings as a father, a mentor, and a god, he delivers these things and rights the wrongs he committed. 
and that deliverance is cathartic in a grand, mythic way. Sam finds his purpose in the love of a father he was sure abandoned him. Korra finds the permission to be the hero and become the main character of her own story, and Clue finds absolution in his failure to create perfection. While the philosophical core of the original film was fun and peppy in a 1980s Disney live-action adventure movie sort of way, it could be summed up pretty easily with, what if little guys lived in your computer, and what if video games but for real? Kaczynski evolves and gracefully expands the horizons of the Tron world. Tron Legacy is a fun adventure movie, yes, but it's more interested in, well, I'll let Jeff Bridges take it again. Science, philosophy, every idea man has ever had about the universe up for grabs. Biodigital jazz, man. Sure, this kind of lofty philosophizing is antithetical to the fun and groovy good time that made the original Tron so sticky in the first place, but that's Joseph Kaczynski in a nutshell, isn't it? What Kaczynski gets so right in a Tron sequel, and a 30 years later sequel in the first place, is the opposite lesson Hollywood seems to have drawn from the entire idea of legacy sequels. Now, Tron Legacy didn't create the legacy sequel, a term I've been stealing liberally from the man who coined it, Screen Crush editor Matt Singer, but it did codify a lot of the tenets of this now omnipresent genre. Lonely kid must answer the call of the old thing, find the old guys who first did the old thing, get guided by the old guys while experiencing the old thing, and then get handed the keys to the old thing by the old guys to give the franchise new life, thus turning it into new thing and perpetuating Hollywood's rapid descent into incessant IP exploitation. The key difference between Kaczynski and the filmmakers that followed in his footsteps, though, is reflexivity. Namely, Joseph Kaczynski is one of the least reflexive visionary filmmakers in Hollywood today. He's so single-minded on his own aesthetic and narrative goals that he seems to forgo the role of filmmaker as audience insert that plagues so many modern blockbusters. We're living in the age of filmmaker as fanboy. Many of these legacy sequels falter on a story level and feel broadly the same because they're less about the source material and more about the experience the filmmaker had watching the source material as a kid. In the 60s through the 80s, there was a fresh new generation of filmmakers who loved movies, who saw them as more than just a career, but an opportunity to express their love of the art form. And they took this love and created their own interesting, original works of cinema that reshaped the very landscape of filmmaking by recontextualizing and recombining all of the things that influenced them into something new. This synthesis created the Hollywood Renaissance of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and all of the beloved franchises thereof. Today, that pipeline looks remarkably similar. We have a generation of filmmakers who were raised on movies. Movies in the cinema, movies on VHS tapes, and movies played and replayed endlessly on television. Except now there's no funding to make the visionary blockbusters that will reshape Hollywood in the future. In fact, there's barely any money to make the cheap, interesting stuff that lets you make those movies in the first place. But we do have all of these intellectual properties from the 70s and 80s sitting on the shelf not making Hollywood any new money. So they turn to these nerds. These nerds that love these things so much, and whose love is so apparent that it'll win over the other diehard nerds that make up part of the demographic Hollywood is trying to service. So they're handed the movies they loved as kids, and get to make movies that continue those stories. And they freak out, and it shows, because each and every one of these movies, The Muppets, Jurassic World, Terminator Genesis, Star Wars The Force Awakens, and most recently Ghostbusters Afterlife, have this very universal starstruck paralysis to them. They're meeting their favorite celebrity, and they have nothing interesting to say. So instead, these filmmakers do what many of us do when confronted with our greatest heroes in person. We try to let them know we exist by telling them the impact they've had on us. So instead of delivering something we've never seen before, they give us references to the things we've already seen and already loved. They give us echoes that sound more like quotes and long, impassioned screeds about the universal importance and impact of the Muppets or Han Solo or Michael Myers or, I don't know, Slimer. They smother any potential for new ideas with their own possessive love of the source material, creating second-generation copies as hollow as Tron Legacy was incorrectly accused of being. Other than the surface-level trappings we discussed earlier, Tron Legacy has almost nothing in common with these expeditions into the navels of sad middle-aged dudes and their action figures. Kaczynski eschews cheap callbacks and lazy lockstep nostalgia. 
The film is dedicated to building upon the legacy of Tron and adding to that legacy visually, philosophically, and narratively. It's a film that's enriched by its original, not smothered by it or beholden to it. And while at the time of recording I've not seen Kaczynski's latest Lega sequel, Top Gun Maverick, the reviews are making it sound like he's taken that ethos to the next level in astonishingly satisfying ways. And while Tron Legacy was a critical misfire and only a modest financial success, perhaps its true legacy should be as a creative and sustainable roadmap for Hollywood's obsession with leveraging nostalgia. Let more unproven filmmakers take your properties and use them as a jumping off point. Take the guardrails away, gamble big, let them play and create breathtaking new worlds inside the ones you already own. Because if all we have left is IP exploitation, we could do a lot worse than these films being anywhere near as fascinating, ambitious, or exhilarating as Tron Legacy. Thank you all for watching Too Many Tapes. Please like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit the bell icon to get updates for when I upload new videos. What do we even want out of Tron 3? Joseph Kaczynski isn't directing it, which bums me out, but I'm all ears. Let me know in the comments. Did you see Top Gun yet? The me who's recording this hasn't, and I literally cannot stop thinking about it. If you want to help out a small YouTube creator, consider donating a dollar or more to my Patreon. I spend literally every dollar I get on this show, and it's been a real joy to know that some of you want to directly fund the dumb words that come out of my mouth. So thank you so much. If you donate 50 or more dollars a month, you, well, you're Cammy, and you're the star of the show. And your name is Glitchy now, because it's techie and cool, and you're techie and cool. I don't know if you're techie. This has really gotten away from me. If you donate 20 or more dollars a month, you're The Grid, because you're a digital frontier. And you get to have your name in the credits in an enormous font like Nato Kitsch. Or you can also be like Mippa and have your name in the credits in an enormous font too. For $10 or more a month, you're Biodigital Jazz, man. And your name gets to be pretty big in the credits too. And for $5 a month, you're the users, because I'm Tron and I fight for you. Also, you get early access to my videos, which is basically hacking. Thank you all again for watching, and I'll see you next time on Too Many Tapes. Shut up and sit down.